Cultural Center. We have uh, Mary Ramaya here and Junior Binu. Uh, welcome to Keeping Up with the Chaldeans. Uh, we're going to highlight the uh, Chaldean Cultural Center on uh, an episode of Keeping Up with the Chaldeans. And Mary was gracious enough to uh, offer to give us a tour and then sit down and uh, give us a little more background on it and what we can all do to, to help uh, bring our culture alive. So I want to welcome you to the Chaldean Cultural Center. Um, the center, this is a boutique museum, and the cultural center is more than the museum. We do programming, but probably our crown jewel is the, um, the museum itself. And it officially opened in September of 2017. And before we actually step into the museum, above the main entrance, there's a sculpture which was done by one of our Chaldean, local Chaldean artists. So, we want to highlight the work of some of our artists uh, when we can. It says, and so it's the Lion of Babylon, and then in English, obviously, Chaldean Cultural Center, and above the lion is Chaldean Cultural Center in Aramaic. So we're going to step into the museum, and the first gallery is ancient Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. The Sumerians were conquered by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians moved the capital from Ur to the city of Babylon, which is just south of modern day Baghdad. And probably the Babylonian ruler that we are most familiar with is Hammurabi. And what Hammurabi was noted for was codifying the laws that were in existence at his time. He didn't create all these laws, but he he um, categorized them so that all the criminal laws were together, all the civil laws were together, all the laws dealing with family and marriage and children and adoption were together. And those are written in, in there? Cuneiform writing. Cuneiform. That's, so you're looking, first of all, we bought this from the Louvre. This is an authentic replica. And I love saying that because it's an oxymoron. Yeah. How can it yes. be a authentic replica uh, if it's authentic? Uh, yeah. right? yeah. But anyways, that's one of my like jumbo shrimp. Anyways, so this is from the Louvre, and the Louvre has the original one. And any other stele or code of laws you see anywhere else in the world outside of the Louvre in Paris is exactly what we have here. And what the Louvre did is, and many museums do this, it's a way for them to make money. They take their famous artifacts and make cast it, and make a cast of it, and then sell replicas to museums around the world. Yes. And so we, um, if you look closely, every single rectangle is a law. Some laws are two lines, and some laws are one line, some laws are three lines. What some of the red dots represent on here? So the red dots we added, I don't want you to think Hammurabi was into color coding, <laughs> but we are. <laughs> so we had our media producer mm -hmm. um, activate eight laws, four on the front of the stele and four on the back. The date of 33 AD is what we commonly use as a time of, of the crucifixion of Christ. And the, again, for the environment, this is, in this gallery, the lighting is a little bit subdued and we created an, an arch mm -hmm. in the ceiling to give this um, feeling of a sacred space like you would have in the church. That's beautiful. That that is a Last Supper sculpture, and there's actually a story behind that. About five months before the museum was finished, mm -hmm. I got a call from the architects uh, from New York, and they said, you know, that we have nothing on the wall going from the Faith and Church Gallery into the Village Gallery. Let's add a decorative element. And, and we had, they, they remembered that we had a picture of this Last Supper sculpture. A lot of Chaldeans have given us pictures of the, their families in the villages and what things have looked like back, you know, in the 1900s and so forth. 
So above the main church, in my understanding, in Tel Kerpa, which is, or Tel Kerf in Arabic, Tel Kerpa in Aramaic, or Surah, where most of the Detroit, original Detroit Chaldeans came from, from that village, the main church was Sacred Heart Church. And in Sacred Heart Church, above the main altar, was a Last Supper sculpture. And so we decided to, I sent a picture of that to the company in Ohio. They fabricated a miniature of it. And our goal was so that like our, my parents, um, m many of the original pioneers are now deceased, but people that sort of grew up in Tel Kappa before, you know, and sure. then came to America, would remember this and, and it would be a, a way of mm. honoring them That's and thanking nice. them, you know, and, some, and uh, something familiar to them. Mm -hmm. When ISIS overtook uh, Mosul, it, well, that whole in, in Nineveh Plain area, yeah. um, Sacred Heart Church itself was not destroyed. It, I, my understanding, it became sort of a command headquarters for ISIS. Mm. But they destroyed all the iconography yeah, in geez. it, all the statues, the crosses, the altar, wow. totally desecrated, including this Last Supper sculpture. Mm. Since ISIS has been driven out, there have been some Chaldeans who have come here and photographed that with the hope of when that church wow. is rebuilt, they would like to restore the sculpture. So what be, was the copy has it's now become the original. The original. Yeah. Underneath, the underneath, the original. It, underneath that, is that Aramaic? That it's, it's Arabic. I asked Arabic. that too. Okay. And it's Arabic, and it's um, Christ eating with his apostles before his death. Okay. Uh, but it's the last one. Yeah. We are leaving the Faith and Church Gallery. The date on the floor is 1890. And we are now in the Nineveh Plain. So this is the village gallery, mm -hmm. and we don't specify any particular village. There are over 120 villages. Um, Tel Kerpa, or Tel Kerpa was one of the largest, or was the largest, is my understanding. And again, it's where the first of the Chaldeans to come to America were from Tel Kerpa. But there's Al Korsh, there's Batnaya, Tescopa, a lot of villages. Mm -hmm. And um, Mary, those bracelets and those earrings remind me of my grandma and mom mm -hmm. and all. That's like a lot of them, what they wore and come back from home. Yeah, looks so real. We had, again, a lot of pictures that people gave us. Yeah. And so we tried to make the clothing as authentic as possible. And I even went to a local jewelry store mm -hmm. um, and looked for Fadada, you know, looked yeah. for the gold yeah, Fadada, yeah. bangle. And, yeah. I've, and I have, like, some jewelry that my in-laws have given me that have these turquoise stones, yep. you know, yeah. earrings yeah. and rings. Turquoise carpet, turquoise that yeah. everybody used to wear. Yeah. The, uh, the turquoise that she's sitting on, and along with her earring, has that color sequence again, too. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the women had long hair, and they would braid their hair. Yeah. Um, I, in fact, my mother's passport picture, she came in 1937. Her hair is in braids. We have a tenor. So she's in her inner courtyard making bread, mm -hmm. and um, there's a tenor, a tenora, where she she'll bake the bread. Um, it's a clay there. oven, right? That's what it was, like a clay oven for them? Yes, yeah, a clay oven. Yeah. And then we even show some of the Chaldean food, like. Yeah, yeah what is that? Kadi and Timon? Kadi and uh, <laughs> One of my Doma. favorites, Dolma. <laughs> <laughs> and on this side, we have a man in the wheat fields. And actually, I have to give credit to Han Nishina. He gave us this costume for mm -hmm. um, almost everything in this gallery is from Chaldeans that they gave us when they came, that they brought with them when they came to America. And so because our people were farmers, I mean, depending on how far north the village was, some had wheat and barley, some had melons and vegetables and, and fruit. Mm -hmm. And we made, we had the company make a wheat field. And so he, the gentleman, uh, showing a Chaldean gentleman, is um, has a bundle of like clothing and he's going to like go to another village and maybe barter selling clothing that his wife may have crocheted oh, wow. and then in return bring back maybe fruits or vegetables or items 
that another village has that maybe his own village did not have. Right. Yeah. The year is 1933, and I picked that year because by 1933, there were Chaldeans fully established with businesses in Detroit. The Chaldeans, the first Chaldean that we can document who came to America was named Zaya Atala and he came in 1889 and he went to Philadelphia, worked in a hotel, went back, went to Baghdad, went back, went to Baghdad and opened up a hotel. So all you Chaldean hotel owners, <laughs> you're part of a long hair, uh, a history. long history yep. that goes back to 1889. Yeah, and you can thank the Apollos. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by 1910, the, um, there were Chaldeans here. This is a picture of uh, some Nager men uh, who were here in, in the U.S. And all of these documents are from different immigration periods. This is the earliest that we documented, but um, this is Tom George, uh, Mike George's dad, who owned mm -hmm. Melody Farms Dairy, that wow. was his original passport, and his name, his name was Tobia Judju Lucia, mm -hmm. and when he, a lot of the immigrants went through Ellis Island, and then sometimes either they changed their names or the immigration officer who <laughs> processed them changed their names, so um, he became Tom George although his last name was really Lucia, or Lucia, mm -hmm. and, and then he wrote to all of his brothers and sisters, you know, if you come to America, use the name of George, so, uh. because I'm gonna, you know, because he would petition for them under right. his, his American Legal name. Legal name, yeah. Yes. And some of these, one of these documents even says that this person was born in Mesopotamia. Some, one of these documents is, mentions the United Kingdom, because after World War I, Iraq was, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Iraq became a protectorate of England. And so, um, so it was just interesting collecting documents that show different time periods. The Kingdom of Iraq, the Republic of Iraq. These medals were given to us by Don Casa. By the time of World War II, there were definitely established families and we had either American-born or Chaldeans who came as children, but who as adults fought in World War II. Mm. And uh, Don Casa was in the U.S. Army and gave us his Army medals. Mm. And he was uh, in Europe when the war ended. He was in Germany and helped liberate, his division liberated one of the concentration camps. Yeah. It was a, Cal there were some Chaldeans who went to work for a Syrian grocery store owner and they learned the grocery business through the Syrian people but the grocery business was comfortable for them because they were farmers and they already knew produce and grains and were used to bartering so going to the eastern market and talking to farmers and and asking for a five bushels of beans and how much they're going to pay for them was already part of their nature. Mm -hmm. So this is a 1933 Chaldean-owned Detroit grocery store. What Chaldean, what store was it? Okay, we modeled it after the store of Jack Nager. Oh, okay. But we don't, and Jack Nager had a store, it was Jack and Aziz Nager, mm -hmm. had a store on Woodward Avenue. We did not, and it, I'm trying to remember the name. Anyways, um, was, okay. We didn't want to name any person's particular store. We're not, okay. And so we just called it Woodward Market. Okay. And, and just generic. It's yeah. just a generic mm -hmm. store. Yep. And I actually wrote to General Foods in Minneapolis and asked them to send me high resolution images of what their canned goods and their boxes look like from the third. Yes. Yeah. And well, you've so, done a lot of work here. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've poured your heart into I, this place. Yes. It's a beautiful. Uh, thing. These aren't these, Thank you very much. These aren't new names. That's the thing. She went deep to be yeah. able to get all this stuff. Look at that. I even went to. Well, I didn't do this on purpose. I happened to be in downtown Milford shopping, and I found an antique radio. 
and it's actually playing a Detroit Tiger baseball game from the 1930s. Wow. Our yeah. media producer contacted WWJ Radio, and at that time, that was the radio station the games were on. And I remember even this in my dad's store, because growing up Chaldean, you had to work in your dad's store. Yeah, of course until, you did. So you either went off to college, or got married, married yeah. or took over the store, yeah. you know, whatever yep. came first. And so um, they would have the radio on so that the customers could listen to a ball game. So we got we got a tape from WWJ Radio. Had to get permission from Major League Baseball mm -hmm. to actually play this. Wow. So you actually will hear a, a part of a snippet of a Detroit Tiger baseball game. Oh, that's amazing. All of these items, the Toledo scale, the cash register, the adding machine, even with the paper still in it. This is Modorga Diku. Um, that was his actual ledger where he kept track of all his customers and how much money he took in every day. His, uh, his family donated uh, some of the pages to us. I don't know if you remember the old... Do I? Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. My mom, that's how we keep in touch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's not the 1930s. That's a little bit right. later. Yep. Yeah. But um, we even went on eBay. I went to a flea market sales looking for old things from from the 1930s, as, as authentic as we could get. These are our stores. Very nice. This is our office. And again, the Chaldean Cultural Center is more than just the museum, although the museum is, is the highlight. So we have a gift shop, so if people want to come in and buy items, um, some books, one of the books we published ourselves, the, the book on the Chaldeans. Others are like some of the cookbooks like Mava Sima or Julia, Julie Nager's uh, cookbook or is it Samira Chola? Yep. I know the last name is Chola, but yep, Samira. for Samira. Yep. Even the Chaldean for kids that uh, like Margaret Shamoon and uh, Melody uh, put together. Yep, that's in that corner right there and uh, note cards, and, and I have some on, on the table when we talk, I'll show you. And we can have a meeting in here, and we do lectures in here or presentations. Sometimes I'll do a presentation before they go into the museum and then mm. go into the museum. We've had educators here, we've had medical professionals here, we've had law enforcement here just answering their questions that they may have about Chaldeans because they have to be trained in cultural diversity, sure. not just with the Chaldean population, but we are a major population in Southeast Michigan. Mm -hmm. So this is our office, it's our gift shop, it's our lecture room, it, it, a library of books, and some in English, some in Arabic, some in Aramaic, okay. that have been donated to us or the church has given us that people can take out and gotcha. so forth. All right, so well, that's, thanks for the tour. Uh, let's go sit down and have a conversation and see what uh, our audience can do for the uh, driving culture. Yeah.